Hey everyone, how's it going? So about a year ago, I wanted to figure out what the minimum number of battles one would need to be in in order to defeat Pokemon Red and Blue. For those of you who haven't seen, actually there are three videos, two in Red and Blue and one in Yellow version. Give them a watch now, they're pretty good in my opinion. And today we're going to continue that series looking at the sequels, Gold and Silver. Now for those of you who don't remember those videos or want a quick refresher, a battle is any time you battle a trainer and any time you battle a wild Pokemon where you don't run away immediately. So that includes catching the Pokemon. The idea is to leave as many people and Pokemon alone as possible. In addition, all the standard j -Rose rules are going to be in effect, such as no items in battle, and we're not going to be using any glitches. And with that said, let's talk about the beginning of the run, because in a way, it's often the most important part. Deciding which starter to pick is very important. Because there's so few Pokemon we actually can catch in these runs, our starter is going to have to put in some work. And so, which one seems best for the road ahead? Well, funny enough, originally, I thought it would be Cyndaquil. This would not be the case, and as you can see, I ended up picking Totodile. And let me just say, Totodile is awesome for this run. For so many reasons, the first of which is coming up very shortly, but we're going to get in our first battle with rival number one. This battle is fairly easy, although we will be at only level five, since we're not going to be able to knock out any of the wild Pokemon. Those would be extra battles. This is as good a time as any to mention that if we were to lose, it still counts as a battle. So we can't simply lose to the same trainer over and over to get more experience points. That would be extra battles. And because we have so few trainers that, well, not so few, but few relatively speaking, we need to make sure we defeat rival one. But you're holding a berry, it should be fine. After we do that and finish talking to Professor Elm, we're going to get into our second battle. Not Youngster Joey, he's actually skippable but youngster Mikey, who has a Rattata and a Pidgey. And I'm actually going to skip ahead because this battle is fairly easy. What I want to talk about next is this Bug Catcher. Because here's where we need to talk about what makes Gold and Silver a lot more frustrating than Red and Blue. Many trainers in these games spin around, some predictably and some randomly. And this makes trying to get by them very, very frustrating. Now, because it's not a speedrun, we can just save and reset until we're able to do so. So it's really not that big a deal, but not mentioning the spinners wouldn't be giving you an accurate picture of what it's like to do one of these minimum battles runs yourself. Anyway, that is the only trainer we actually have to battle on routes 30 and 31, so we're gonna make it to Violet City. Sprout Tower is a great place to grind experience points. But we can't do that because it's not mandatory. You don't need Flash, it just makes it well, it just makes it less awful. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Anyway, we have to go into the gym and battle two Bird Keepers and then Faulkner himself. The first Bird Keeper, Bird Keeper Abe, is why Chikorita just simply doesn't work. He has a level 9 Spiro, and for Chikorita, that is just a no-go. Cyndaquil will be fine here, but Totodile has a really cool move that, for those of you who are used to my Generation 1 challenges, you're going to laugh, it is actually Rage. Rage works a little bit differently. The biggest difference being I don't have to use it every single turn, but every time I'm hit with an attack after I select Rage, I believe its power is increased by 50% to a maximum of four times. But this is a rare time where my research was a little inconclusive, so I think that's what it does. Regardless, it gets stronger. And because we're hit many, many times in these battles, Rage is a much, much better move to use then Scratch, that will just stay at 40 base power. And that's going to be a really useful strat going forward. But I do want to mention Faulkner himself, because I actually have never lost a Faulkner as Totodile, but with Cyndaquil, it is just so unlikely you'd ever win. Basically, the first Pidgey has two moves, Mud Slap and Tackle. Tackle has same type bonus, and is a normal move, Mud Slap's a ground move. Faulkner will use this against Cyndaquil, because it's super effective, and that is all he will use until he's used up all 10 power points, by which point you barely hit anything. And Cyndaquil's move it gets instead of Rage is Smokescreen, completely unhelpful. For Totodile, it's going to go for Tackle because it's a much more powerful attacking move, and if we equip a Berry, we can just absorb all those Tackles, make our Rage more and more powerful, and then eventually, once we get to Pidgeotto, 
Typically, it's a three-hit KO, although it could be even a two-hit KO. And that's badge number one. Five battles down total, many, many more to go. And this is a good point to talk about something that I know if I don't address, I'm going to get so many comments down below, which is good for the algorithm, but I do want to give you the best information. For many of us, gold and silver and crystal are nearly identical. They are by far the most similar three games in the series. That being said, there are weird changes to Crystal that affect this run a ton. Namely, that a bunch of trainers are moved slightly. The first example of this is Youngster Albert. In Crystal, he is skippable, but he is not in Gold and Silver. And there are a few more trainers just like him. Now, Crystal is awful. I really, really, really do not want to do a Crystal video. But because I might, I'm not going to go over every single difference in this video. Just keep in mind that if you think a trainer isn't mandatory, it's very, very possible you're thinking of their slightly different placement in Crystal that in fact does make them not mandatory, while their position in Gold and Silver means you have to actually battle them. And one of the biggest concentration of these trainers, weirdly enough, is in this segment of the game. Not really sure why, but yeah, that is what it is. Anyway, we can skip ahead. There are two trainers in Union Cave, including one with three Geodudes. We don't yet have Water Guns. You might assume, oh no, J Rose, how are you going to beat him? Rage is fine. Rage works. It's a really, really good move, and we're going to continue to use Rage in Slowpoke. Well, there are four more trainers there, bringing our total to 12, and then we can head to Azalea Gym. There are three mandatory trainers here, including a choice of two. And we're going to go to the left and battle Bugcatcher Josh, because that's my name. No, that's not why. The real reason we're going to battle Bugcatcher Josh is because he only has a single Pokemon. And whenever there are a choice of two mandatory trainers, we have to battle one. We will always pick the trainer with less Pokemon. Because it just feels like the spirit of the rule. And you might notice I have a Pokemon fainted. That's the Togepi egg. You really shouldn't need to use it in this run, but it's good to hatch just in case. All right, so after beating Bugcatcher Josh, there's another trainer that rotates around, and then we battle Bugsy. Bugsy actually isn't too bad, because you can just use Rage. The Metapod and Kakuna deal very little damage to you, so you build up quite a bit of Rage power, and by the time you get to Scyther, so long as you're not poisoned, which of course I am, you should be fine. We should be fine either way, because Scyther is typically only a 2 at KO, Quick Attack is better than Fury Cutter, because Fury Cutter doubles every turn it's used. And, like I said, here's Fury Cutter, nothing to worry about. We still have 13 HP, and we have beaten Bugsy. That's 10 trainers in this section for a total of 15, and so far so good. And, oh yeah, Totodile is now Crocona. Pretty awesome, because we have to battle Rival 2. And Rival 2 took me a long time when I was trying to plan this route. And finally, I figured out a very, very consistent way of defeating him. First things first, you want to equip a Paralysis Cure Berry because Ghastly uses Lick, and that will paralyze you at some point. The second thing is once the battle begins, you're going to set up two Leer. Unfortunately, I get put to sleep. That is pretty common, but it's not a big deal. Lick does next to nothing. It only has Lick, Hypnosis, and Spite. Not really that much to worry about. Once you've woken up and used both Leer, you're then going to go for Water Gun, and then you're going to use 3 Fury Cutter. I actually end up getting a critical hit, so it only took 2 Fury Cutters. That's actually kind of bad, because I'm not sure if we'll knock out the Bayleaf, and that is our big concern. Thankfully, we outspeed, but we don't knock out the Bayleaf due to that critical hit. Razor Leaf doesn't critical hit. The critical hit ratios are normal. And we're able to knock out Bayleaf, but we have to deal with Zubat. We could potentially lose, but spoiler alert, I don't. Typically, the Zubat portion is very trivial because you have a ton of health and you've just won a KO'd Bayleaf. And of course, because it's me, I'm showing you what the real battle should look like. And it's the same thing. I just don't get that annoying critical hit to knock out Ghastly. So Bayleaf is a 1 at KO. So I have tons of HP for Zubat. And even if you get hit by Supersonic, you should have more than enough HP, even if you decide to use Fury Cutter for some inexplicable reason. But yeah, that is Rival 2. 
It looks like Crocona can't be beat. But according to many, Whitney is one of the hardest gym leaders in these types of challenge runs. High level Pokemon, roll out Miltank, we're gonna need something to help us out. Well, I have an idea. Just north of Goldenrod City, once we get there, and shockingly, there are no battles in Ilex Forest, or even with all the trainers on Route 34, you can actually just walk around them and make it to Goldenrod City, where we're gonna pick up a Spiro, nicknamed Kenya, that you're supposed to deliver on Route 31, just east of Violet City, but I have other plans for this Spiro, at least for now. You see, we're gonna go right to Whitney's gym, and I want this Spiro to level up a little bit. There's actually only one mandatory trainer in this entire gym. It's shocking, but you can actually take a very specific route and skip all but one trainer in Whitney's gym. It's kind of crazy how many times you can do that in this game. But yeah, we're going to weaken this Snubble with Crocona and have our Spearow knock it out to gain those experience points. And one thing you might notice about the Spearow, which is different from other gift Pokemon, is that it still maintains its original trainer number, so it gains 1.5 times experience points. It's pretty cool. But of course, it's not going to stand up to Whitney. So let's go and use Crocona and see what it can do. Well, it can do a lot. Because Clefairy can use Metronome and this can completely ruin the run. Metronome sucks and we can't plan for that. But if it uses Double Slap, every single hit of Double Slap increases rage. After being hit with so many times, Miltank actually goes for rollout and misses. And yeah, we're doing half. It hits with rollout, and now we're going to do more than enough damage, and yeah. Even the mighty Whitney stands no chance against Rage Crocona. I mean, it's just too good. And you know what? It is so good, I think we're going to have to retire it. I think this should be Crocona's last battle. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. That's not why we're retiring it. Yes, Battle 18 is Crocona's final battle. From now on, we're gonna be using Kenya the Spiro. And we've already talked about a massive reason why. The 1.5 times experience gain is massive, but it's not just that. Firo, when it eventually evolves, has decent enough attack and speed and a decent enough move pool that we're gonna be able to do some damage. In addition, we can change the clock to Sunday and eventually pick up the TM for return. Our friendship isn't high enough to do it yet, but we will eventually do that. And that is a base 102 power, same type normal move. Firo is actually very good. And before you say, wouldn't it be better with Crocona slash Feraligator or Kadabra or Machoke or whatever? I actually tried runs with every single one of them. And as you're going to see, Kenya the Spiro, by far, is the best and most consistent. But before I can show off how good Kenya is, we need to level it up a bit more. So I go to the underground. There are two super nerds you can battle, and we're going to teach Mudslap for the second one with the Magnemite. And then we're just going to head north through the National Park, wake up Sudowoodo, and head to Ekritik, right? Wrong. We're not going to do any of that. Because... There are at least, I believe, three mandatory trainers. Or so you'd think. Because, here's a thought. Why do we have to water the Sudowoodo from there? Why can't we backtrack, go all the way back through Ilex Forest, through Union Cave, back up to Violet City, and then just approach it from the right? The answer? There's nothing stopping us. And that saves three mandatory battles. And so, we're going to wake up the Sudowoodo, and we're going to run away. Which, like Snorlax in Red and Blue, does not count as a battle. A battle is only if we do something. We just ran away. And just like any wild encounter, that's not a battle. As long as we don't catch it or attack it. So we're still at 20 battles. There is a mandatory one. This trainer with the drowsy, 
very annoying battle. And from here on out, we're going to be using Kenya for every single battle. We should not be using Krokona pretty much ever if nothing goes wrong. And from here, we're going to go right to Ekritik Gym. And there's a couple things we should note here. First off, the Ghastly can't do very much to us because the only real move they can damage us with is Curse. And that takes away half their HP. And so long as the first Ghastly doesn't use Curse, we actually don't have to do anything. But if it does, we can swap into any of our Pokemon. I swap into Abra, allow Ghastly to knock it out, and then just use Spearow with Peck, and that, that does it. We can do this anytime. This isn't a solo run. And this is where I said if something goes wrong, anytime we're confused or something, we always can switch into our other Pokemon to take away the confusion. I forget about this a lot because I'm so used to solo runs, but it's kind of nice being able to do so. But here's something I want to talk about. Typically, when you think about how to get through Ecritique, because you have to walk along a certain path or you get sent back to the beginning of the gym, you think that this is the path you're supposed to go. But there's actually a second path that I never knew about where you can actually skip the second trainer. What? What? I, I didn't know that. But anyway, the final of the three mandatory trainers here is Medium Martha. Once you defeat her, so long as you've gotten enough experience points from either the Snubble or the Slowpoke and Magnemite Voltorb, you will be able to evolve into Firo before the Morty battle. And uh, that's pretty important because Morty is not easy and Firo is significantly better than Spiro. And because of that, I actually slightly altered my route from what it used to be. I'm going to go battle the Kimono Sisters right now. Each of them has an evolution and they give a ton of experience points. The order doesn't really matter, although it's best to battle Jolteon last for obvious reasons, but none of them for Firo should be much of a problem. And so that will bring us to 29 battles, meaning Morty will be lucky number 30. And before we battle him, there's actually something we can do. And actually, this is a good time to talk about something we can't do. Because you might say, well, Jeros, why don't you just go left down through Olivine to the lighthouse, and then there's some mandatory trainers there. You can get more experience points. Well, my first run, that's exactly what I did. And guess what? You get soft locked. Let me explain. There is a one way ledge that allows you to skip these three mandatory trainers just north of Olivine. However, since ledges are only one way, there's no way of getting back to Ecrity without battling this Pokefan right here. And I was devastated. I was so mad at myself. And so obviously I don't bother going to the lighthouse now, but I actually could because all I really need is Abra and not to heal in the Pokemon Center. Future Jero's here. Just a quick thing. I forgot to mention that I use coins to purchase an Abra from the game corner, which is how I have one in my party. Anyway, back to the video. But for now, we're actually just going to get this Mint Berry. Speaking of Morty Battle. And yeah, let's talk about it. All right, so we're just going to use Peck. The first Ghastly, we don't want to see Curse. We see it. It's not the end of the world because we can just switch. But it wastes a little bit of time. Since it did use Curse, we're going to swap into Abra. And luckily, Haunter uses Curse. So that's going to put it at half HP. And Abra faints pretty quickly. So another useful reason to have this Abra... Now it should be a 1 KO by Firo. And here's where the scariest Pokemon is, Gengar. I'm going to go for Mudslap, hoping Hypnosis, of course, it hits. But we have the Mint Berry. And after a Mudslap, Hypnosis should only hit 45% of the time. All right. Well, this is probably a loss because it's just going to go for Dream Eater. And it regains a bunch of its HP. And okay. So this is bound to happen. We tried as best we can to avoid it. But it does happen. And we just try again. All right, so it starts off the same way as the other one did. We get Peck, we get Curse, we knock it out, we swap into Abra, but this time Haunter doesn't use Curse. So that's pretty annoying because it's going to be a 2 KO for Kenya. And of course, Haunter decides to use Curse, so we're going to have to swap Kenya into something else to get rid of the Curse. And since things have been going badly, I decide to swap into Krokona, even though I could have swapped into Togepi. So Krokona will see another battle, and I'd like it to actually get damage on this Gengar or a Leer or something, but... Of course, that doesn't end up happening, and Gengar quickly dispatches of Krokona. So now let's see if the odds will be in my favor. So Mudslap, Hypnosis Miss, Peck. 
All right, I'm actually probably not getting the ranges I need because I should be a 3 KO. It's not going to be, so I just go for another Mud Slap. Of course, I'm put to sleep, but I got the Mint Berry, and we knock out Gengar, and now the battle's over. I go for Peck, it does half. Usually goes for Curse, this time it goes for Mean Look. And that is battle number 30, aka Morty. Probably the scariest gym leader we've had in a while, but we were able to persevere, and now we're going to head to Olivine. In the Lighthouse, there are shockingly few trainers that are mandatory. For the longest time, I thought there were four mandatory trainers, but I didn't realize that these holes, which are two tiles long, it actually saves your location. I thought it always put you in the same spot. I don't know why. So, only three mandatory trainers in the entire Lighthouse. And then we're going to surf to Cyanwood. Crocona can learn Cut, Strength, Surf, and eventually it'll learn Whirlpool. That's pretty darn good considering we can't really catch many Pokemon for HM purposes. Something that may end up making minimum battles less minimal in some games going forward. I don't know yet. But we're going to surf to Cyanwood. There are tons of trainers, all of which can be avoided. My favorite thing in a run like this. Some of you might think I get the Shuckle, but there's really no purpose. Kenya is faster and overall better. Shuckle with rollout seemed easy, but trust me, Kenya is, is going to be far better. All right, now it's time to go to Chuck's gym, and it's unfortunate that we're not going to have Drill Peck. I did change the date so that I had Sharp Beak, so I will get slightly more power out of Peck, but Drill Peck would have made this completely trivial. Anyway, none of the trainers here are too tough, but they're also not easy because Peck doesn't deal that much damage, and it's even possible Return would have done more damage, but... To backtrack to Goldenrod would have taken a long time, and we're just about to get the HM for Fly, so I'm going to just make do with Peck. Like I said, trainers aren't too bad. And now it's time to battle Chuck. So, it's very unfortunate that Fero's Peck is not a 1 KO against Primate. It comes pretty close. But it uses Leer, so we're going to swap, because I'd rather my defense not be dropped for Polyrath. So, thanks Togepi, very useful, and now we knock out Primate. Polyrath is pretty luck-based because Dynamic Punch is awful, but it's only 50% accurate. So we just don't want to see a Dynamic Punch hit. I go for Peck. It's not doing quite half, and of course. Speaking of half, 50% chance, and so now I'm confused. And, ugh, gosh. Anyway, because I'm confused, I gotta swap to Abra, and here's where I get some good luck. Polyrath has other moves, but it just keeps going for Dynamic Punch. And in Generation 2, unlike Generation 1, AI opponents have power points. So while he finally hit with Dynamic Punch, that's all of them. All five have been used up. So I should pretty much be guaranteed a victory, right? Well, I go for Peck. A critical hit would have been nice. It goes for Surf and... <laughs> okay. Well, that was interesting. It was my first try in this run. Chuck is definitely not the most consistent gym leader with this strat, but... It's consistent enough, usually it takes maybe one to three tries, which isn't too bad. And now that we've defeated him, we're at 38 battles. We can get the HM for Fly, and the only Pokemon we have to fly is Fero. This isn't ideal because I'd love to use that move slot for something else. Thankfully, it's not going to matter. We actually don't need that move slot for a while, so we can stick Fly on Fero. Theoretically, you could run around and your Togepi would eventually evolve into a Togetic so long as you, you know, got it to get some experience points in any of the battles. Not worth it. And oh, I guess this is a good time to mention, the daycare is not allowed in this run. It would make this run completely trivial. And the reason I think about that is we're going to fly back to Goldenrod, get the TM for Return. By this point, our Kenya should like us a lot. So Return's going to do pretty decent damage, a huge upgrade over Peck, and we're going to make our way to the Lake of Rage. From Ecritique to the Lake of Rage, there are so many trainers, you'd think that one of them would have to be mandatory, but none of them are. Nary a single trainer. Hey, I'm not complaining, just a little surprised. Don't worry, the game's gonna make up for it in, like, a second. But anyway, at this point, you can actually take a bit of a detour and go get Hidden Power. And Hidden Power can really make one battle very very easy it can also be useless in this run i believe it was useless i try not to plan for hidden power 
But what you really want is either Hidden Power Ground or Hidden Power Fighting. If you get those, awesome. If not, nah, it's alright. But as they approach the Red Gyarados, they make a mistake. I saved after teaching Hidden Power and got rid of Mud Slap. You want to keep Mud Slap. Holy moly, Jaros. It will be fine, but this is not ideal. Anyway, Red Gyarados is unlike Pseudo Wudo in that you're not allowed to run away. If you do, the game doesn't progress. So it's like Ghost Marowak in that sense. And unlike Ghost Marowak, we can actually catch the Red Gyarados. And you really want to do that because... If you don't, you're not going to have a Pokemon that can learn Waterfall, and that's mandatory to get to Elite Four. So, we're going to just try to catch it as best we can, and if you don't, that's why I saved in front, and you just keep trying until you catch it. But once you do, ugh, this run gets awful. Alright, I love Gold and Silver, they're great games, but in challenge runs, this part is just awful. You have to do the Rocket Hideout. And the Rocket Hideout has, I'm not kidding, 14 mandatory battles. That does include the three Electrode at the end, which you do have to knock out, kind of like Ghost Marowak. So 11 trainers and three Pokemon, and trust me, I have looked for alternate routes. This is the absolute lowest amount of battles. 14. None of the battles are difficult. I'm not going to talk about any of them. But Team Rocket is what makes Gold and Silver just so slow to play sometimes. Because none of the trainers are difficult, and there's just so many of them. So we go from 39 battles up to 53 after we defeat the final Electrode. We still have three badges to go, and yet... We are 15 battles away from surpassing Red and Blue. I think there's a pretty safe bet that's going to happen. But the next badge I actually want to get is Price, who seems like he would be kind of difficult. But thankfully, because we gained so much experience points from the hideout, and this is why being a traded Pokemon is so great, he's not as bad as you think. The one thing I want to bring up is that none of the trainers in his gym are mandatory. It is a little annoying to bypass this spinner, but it is something, at least if you save, it's doable. Okay, so return one at KO Seal. That's pretty easy. It will do significant damage to Dugong. I'd rather see Icy Wind than Aurora Beam, and lowering attack is annoying, because now I'm going to have to swap out, but I'll knock out the Dugong. I'll go into Togepi, so that Piloswine can knock it out, hopefully quickly. And here's where Red Gyarados comes in handy. I'm going to try and weaken this Piloswine. I want Firo to knock it out. So I'm going to use Dragon Rage. Hope nothing crazy happens, because I only need to use one more Dragon Rage. Price will not heal. Dragon Rage is a set damage move. This is awesome. Now I just have to wait for him to knock out my Red Gyarados. Can swap in Firo. And claim those amazing experience points. And uh, that is a pretty solid price battle. But if you were thinking that was a little too easy, don't worry, Jasmine is pretty difficult. Easier than you might think with a flying Pokemon, but still very difficult. First things first, you need a Paralysis Cure Berry, and Mudslap would have been so much better, but it's doable even without Mudslap. Okay, so I go for return, it's a 2 KO. Thunder Wave misses. There's a 25% chance that when the AI uses the saddest move, it fails. So you're hoping for that. At least one of them needs to fail. You knock out Magnemite number one, out comes Magnemite number two. It's going to be the same thing, and it fails again. That's very unlikely. You actually can win this battle, even if you're paralyzed, but it's a heck of a lot easier if you aren't. Now, as you could expect, Firo versus Steelix is a horrible matchup. However, just like with Price, we have a Pokemon that has a pretty easy time against Steelix. And if you wanted to, you could teach Surf and just have Red Gyarados do everything, but I would like Firo to get the experience points. And what you're going to do is very similar. The difference is Jasmine heals. So you're going to need to use four Dragon Rages. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. When Jasmine healed, I used a Leer. That is kind of helpful in case something goes wrong. And it did. I was knocked out. So I had to get Crocona to maybe help me out. And it did. It used Surf. Didn't knock it out, which is good. Steelix goes for Sunny Day. 
And now I'm gonna keep spamming Leer, and the hope is with three Leers and at this amount of health, Return will knock it out. Steelix has great defense, it's gonna be close, but I do it. Very, very good. Yes, this could have been done much easier if I just let Crocona or Gyarados knock out the Steelix, but experience points are limited, even in gold and silver, so it is best that Kenya gets as many as it possibly can. And so, going to the next Team Rocket section, we're at 55 battles. Do you know what we're going to be after the next Team Rocket section? 76. Just, is that not enough? And there's no way of skipping them. There are a couple, pick one of two, and there's a way you can actually softlock yourself on, I believe it's the third floor. If you try and get sneaky and try and battle less trainers than you otherwise would, it, it doesn't work. The biggest reason for that is you can't dig or escape rope out of buildings. So you might think you could skip one of the battles, but you really can't. And I'm going to be honest, I don't want to go more into this than I already have to. Even Rival 3 isn't so bad. He has a Magnemite. Again, wish I had Mudslap, but I won even though I was paralyzed. So there are no battles in this section that were worrisome. And this is where Firo really starts to take off. And when you're stuck with Krokona or Kadab or whatever, you're not going to be as overleveled and you start to encounter more and more issues. And so while potentially in the early to mid game, Krokona slash Feraligator or Kadabra could be better, as the game goes on and Firo starts getting more and more experience points, it gets more and more clear that this is the right call. Anyway, finally, after what feels like a million years, you're able to defeat the final executive, Team Rocket leaves, and then you have to head to Ice Cave. There is one more mandatory trainer just outside of Ice Cave, and Claire's Gym isn't a big break from trainers. There are four mandatory trainers in her gym. Is that enough? That said, because there are so many trainers, Claire herself is beyond easy. The Dragonair are one-hit KOs with Return, which now is at maximum power. And Kingdra's almost a one-hit KO. It goes for Smokestream, the absolute worst thing it could have done. But don't worry, I get a critical hit with Drill Peck the very next turn. I wanted to avoid, I didn't know she had another Hyper Potion, so I wanted to avoid it healing. In the end, I win. That is eight gym badges. That is 82 battles. We are 14 higher than Red and Blue. And we still haven't gotten to the Elite Four yet. There are a bunch of trainers though on routes 27 and 28. Five to be exact. But there are none in Victory Road. Victory Road is shockingly empty. Absence, the final rival battle, Rival Four, there is no Rival Fievel in Gold and Silver. The battle in Burnt Tower is optional in Gold and Silver, while Mandatory and Crystal. And the battle in Mount Moon is also optional. So yeah, this is going to be our final battle versus the rival. Might as well talk about it, I guess. Now, everything is a one at KO, except for Magneton. And as long as you're holding a Paralysis Cure Berry, you're going to win. And look at that. We got a critical hit on the Magneton. <laughs> okay, great. You do have to switch to Drill Peck for Haunter. But yeah. So that was rival number four. Very, very tricky, I know. And if you remember my earlier Minimum Battles video, or heck, any solo run I do... The Elite Four is super difficult. Will that continue in minimum battles with this overpowered Firo? Let's see. So first up, since Laura Lee retired or whatever, we have Wile. And Wile leads off with a Zatu. Okay, I'm kidding. Will leads off with Zatu. It's a 1 KO. Jinx is a 1 KO. Slowbro has very good defense. It's still a 1 KO. Okay, we won. <laughs> the second Zatu is terrible defense. And we can use Drill Peck on Executor. So, yeah. Super difficult. But now we have to face the new Bruno of Gold and Silver, Koga. I mean, let's be honest. No one can be as bad as Red and Blue No. Including Gold and Silver Bruno. But Koga could potentially be annoying. Let's see. All right. Drill Peck Ariados. That's one down. Drill Peck Fortress. And hey, look at that. Not a one to KO. Finally. Of course, it doesn't actually attack me. And it uses spikes. So we still got the perfect HP going, but you know, small victories, Elite Four. I don't know if Muck will be a one at KO. Uh, we got a crit. I still don't know. I don't think it was. I don't think it matters. Crobat will probably be a one at KO. It is. 
And the final Pokemon is Venomoth, which we can use Drill Peck. And, alright, 11 attacks, 10 Pokemon down. Looking pretty good, but, in seriousness, Bruno could potentially be difficult because he's got a Rock Pokemon. Sure, he is also Fighting type, so that will be good for Drill Peck. But, can Bruno redeem himself and defeat Firo and end the perfect run? Well, let's see. We'll hit him on top, Will. Boo, what a lame way for that to end. Quick attack, really? Whatever, it's going to be a one-hit KO, but boo. Anyway, now we have Onyx. I'm going to go for a turn. It's still doing half. <laughs> and it goes for Darude. That's all right. To be fair, unless I got a critical hit, that also would have ended my perfect run. But we knock out Onyx without any further problem. And yeah, we won now. We only have fighting Pokemon left. We potentially could get hit by Mach Punch, I guess, but yeah. Drill Peck will want to KO everything. Firo is pretty good at this so far. But now, in Agatha's place, well, technically in Lance's place, we have Karen. And she's basically the Agatha of Gold and Silver, using very luck-based strategy. So we go from the Agatha Lottery to the Karen, I don't know, Raffle. Truth is, though, in a non-solo run, it really shouldn't be a big deal. Let's see. So Umbreon likes to use annoying status moves. I'd like to knock it out in one hit, and... All right, I think this is going to be fine. <laughs> I mean, if Umbreon was a one-hit KO, nothing else has the HP or defense of Umbreon, so... We're going to have two... And three... Four... Five... Five more at one-hit KOs! <laughs> but you know what, Count? Lance could potentially actually be difficult. I don't know if all his Dragonite will be one of KOs, and Aerodactyl's a rock type. So the reality of the situation is, everything could have been easy up to now, but Lance is actually probably going to be difficult. 92 successful battles. Can we win battle 93? Let's find out. All right, so we have Gyarados. And that's very good. One at KO. It's what we like to see. All right, we've gotten the first level 47 Dragonite. Yes, okay. So that probably means the second one is also going to be a one at KO. And it is. Very, very good. That's half the team down, but the scariest two Pokemon, Aerodactyl and level 50, still remain. Speaking of which, here is Aerodactyl. <laughs> okay. Uh, this run's just going way too well. That was, that was really clutch. Alright, that is, that is four down. Now we just have Charizard and the last Dragonite. Alright, here's Charizard. Very, very good. And the final Dragonite. Will it be a one at KO? No, I think that might be a range, but Outrage doesn't do nearly enough. And we have a first try, clean sweep victory of the Elite Four. And for the record, I wasn't just saying it was a range out of nothing. It is, in fact, a range. I have, in fact, knocked out that Dragonite in a single hit before. Additionally, Rock Slide plus Outrage is not enough to knock me out, unless one of them crits. So this is actually a very consistent strategy. I just got really, really good luck that made it look even easier than it should be. But I've done this run many, many times. And I tend to get the same result, which is why I haven't changed my strategy. So now we're at 93 battles, but the game isn't over. As we know, the game really ends when you defeat Red. And there's still all of Kanto to do. And our first mandatory battle is actually on the way to Kanto. We have to battle that lazy sailor who abandons his post. The only battle on SS Aqua that's mandatory, and it's very easy. Now, once we get to Kanto, we can do many different things in any order we want. Funny enough, the easiest gym leader to battle is Sabrina. She only has three Pokemon, Mr. Mime, Espeon, and Alakazam. We outspeed all of them. We want to KO all of them. No other mandatory trainers in the gym. Very good. Now we're going to complete the side quest that gives us the expanded radio card that will allow us to wake Snorlax and access the rest of Kanto. We have to go to Lavender Town, and then we have to access Rock Tunnel. There are no trainers in Rock Tunnel, but there's one trainer needed to battle to access Rock Tunnel. This trainer is not skippable, but J-Rose, why don't you go from Cerulean to Route 9? Because if you try and go through Route 9, there are like two or three mandatory trainers. 
This is the only path that has one mandatory trainer, and trust me, it sucks, because we have to navigate pitch black rock tunnel. It's not like red and blue where we can see an outline. You just have to memorize the layout and just walk through completely blind. Shouts to my Twitch chat for watching me do this live for the first time in like a year and struggling and shenanigans who gave me a really good map so that I stopped getting lost. Very, very annoying. I wish I had Flash. But speaking of shenanigans, this is why I actually have the Abra because once I heal here, I'm not gonna heal in any more Pokemon centers because I'm gonna fly back to Saffron or Cerulean if I've already gotten there, pick up the machine part, and then just teleport back to this Pokemon Center so I don't have to go through Rock Tunnel a second time. But yeah, the Team Rocket member who steals the machine part, we don't actually have to battle him. In fact, I'm gonna do this little side quest to get Misty to go back to her gym. So we have to head to Bill's house, or I think Bill's grandfather's house at least at this point. And there are seven mandatory trainers we need to battle. They're all insultingly easy, but the significance of talking about these seven is that we have now eclipsed a hundred mandatory battles. Man, that is a lot of battles. And before I go back to the power plant, might as well beat Misty. I'm already here. Misty has four Pokemon, who we outspeed and one to KO with return. Yes, even the Lapras. I know it's very bulky, but nothing can withstand the ultimate power of level 67 Kenya. So that's 10 badges total. And now that we've delivered the machine part, we can battle any gym leader we want. I'm gonna battle Erica because I always forget about her in my red and blue runs. Erica is notable because she also has mandatory trainers in her gym. Misty didn't for the record. And also there is a choice of two trainers. We're gonna battle, I believe it's Picnicker Tanya. She's on the left because she only has an executor and that's less Pokemon. Erica is, well, I mean, come on. We have a Fira. Like, we're gonna use Drill Peck and one to KO every single one of her Pokemon. And her team is essentially the same as it was in Red and Blue, except Blossom replaces Vileplume, and she now has a Jump Bluff. And once we've beaten Erica, we're actually strong enough to go battle Lieutenant Surge. There are three trainers in his gym, only one of which is mandatory. You can battle any of the three, but Gentleman Gregory only has two Pokemon. So that's the one we're gonna choose. As for Surge himself, yes, he has a Magneton, but at this level, Return will even one-hit KO the Magneton. So that is four Kanto Gym Leaders down, zero damage taken. But unfortunately, all good things need to come to an end. We can wake up the Snorlax, head through Diglett Tunnel, and make our way to Pewter City. And we still have to battle that Junior Trainer, so that's another mandatory battle. And we're gonna have to battle Brock. You might think Brock is difficult, but you may have noticed I have agility, and why do I have agility? What am I using that for? The badge boost glitch doesn't exist in Generation 2. Well, I picked up the TM for Curse. And, well, let's just show you. So I'm going to start setting up Curses. Graveler goes for Defense Curl, and it then goes for Rollout. You'll notice I don't have Drill Pick anymore, but I still have Fly, and that's very useful, because we know how devastating Defense Curl Rollout can be. So by flying, it misses and has to reset if Brock decides to use it again. I'm going to go for one more curse, and I'm going to go for an agility, and I should be able to sweep through the rest of Brock's team. All right, so here's Onyx. That's one. Here's Rhyhorn. That's two. Here's Omastar. That's the one I was worried about, and I think, yeah, we definitely will knock out Kabutops. So, once again, Kenya is proving just how amazingly awesome it is at the late game. And that is five gym badges. And we are at 112 battles. That's a lot. Thankfully, the rest of the regular trainers in this game are completely avoidable. As for gym leaders, we have three to go, and the next one we're going to go and battle is Blaine. So we're going to do the same thing where we surf from Pallet Town, avoid all the trainers in the water. We're going to talk to our buddy, Rival Fival, and have him go back to Viridian Gym. And this is going to shock you. We just use Return and Win. However, you can lose. You can lose. I didn't. But it's happened before because Makar goes to a KO and can burn you. And that would result in a loss. 
Not necessarily. You could use curses and agilities, and that's happened to me before. Thankfully, this was pretty standard. And you knock out the Magmar and the Rapidash. And here is where you can avoid another seemingly mandatory trainer. If you try going through Cycling Road to get to Fuchsia City, there is a trainer just outside of Fuchsia that you can't skip. However, if you surf from Seafoam Islands and head to Fuchsia, there are no mandatory trainers. So we can go right to Janine, who is the weakest gym leader by far. She is Pokemon under level 40. How? I mean, I don't know what order they intended us to do these gym leaders, but come on, this is just ridiculous that there is a gym leader this week at this point in the game. Whatever. There are just two trainers remaining. Blue and Red. Two former champions. Will Kenya be able to beat them? Let's find out. Well, against Pidgeot, we want to set up six curses and three agilities. Is that necessary? No. Typically, it's pretty safe to set up against Pidgeot. Unfortunately, I got hit by a critical hit. And Pidgeot kept using Mirror Move to Mirror Move Curse. And for the first time in a very long time, I actually lost a battle. So let's try this again. Well, this time, things go as they normally do. Pidgeot really doesn't have anything to deal much damage to me. And as I use Curse, my defense rises higher and higher. And the attacks do less and less. And so while last time, it was able to knock me out, this time, I'm able to set up all six curses and three agilities and remain at 122 health. And at this point, the battle is over. The next Pokemon is Rhydon. And once you see that we won a KO Rhydon, you know that nothing stands a chance. Curse and agility is just too overpowered or even overleveled. And we're about to make it all the way to red. Pretty easily with just a Firo, but Red has something that Blue did not. And that is a Pokemon that we do not want to set up against, a Pikachu. One with Thunder. So, what are we going to do? Well, first things first, we're going to have to make it through Mount Silver while not being able to see. And thankfully, I've done this so many times that I actually know it like the back of my hand. That's what inspired me to do blindfolded runs, by the way. But, once we make it to red, I had to come up with a strategy that would be consistent enough to justify me using Kenya. Because, the thing is, we know that Kanto is going to be easy. The question is whether red is going to be consistent. For Alligator wasn't. Kadabra wasn't. Will Firo be consistent? Only one way to find out. Like I said, we do not want to set up against this Pikachu at all. So I'm just going to go for return, I outspeed, and I knock it out. Red will then send out Blastoise. I'm just going to go for return, and Red will usually go for Rain Dance. Not sure why this is, sometimes he attacks, but most of the time he goes for Rain Dance, and we'll be able to knock Blastoise out. That's two down. Espeon should easily be a 1 at KO. I mean, it's a Psychic type with really low... What?! I've literally never seen... E Whoa! Thankfully, it didn't attack me, but... Okay, that's a really bad sign. Three down. Now, Snorlax is a higher level, and it has great defense. So I go for a turn. It's not even doing a quarter, I think. Thankfully, it goes for Amnesia. I'm gonna go for return again. And it goes for Body Slam, and wow, that... Okay, I have to reset. I'm not going to be able to win while paralyzed. There's no way. So, let's try this again. Against Pikachu, we're not going to change anything. We're just going to go for a turn and knock it out. We're also not going to change anything versus Blastoise. It was still a 2 KO. Thankfully, it still went for Rain Dance, and we're still able to knock it out. And here is where I need some good luck. Please, okay, thank you. I've never had that not be a 1 KO. And the Reflect made a massive, massive difference. Now Snorlax should be a 2 at KO. Alright, I'm gonna go for a turn. Excellent. And it goes for Amnesia. 
We might not even take any damage. Wow. All right, level 77 Charizard. I'm going to go for return. It's going to go for flamethrower. Not a big... Oh. Well, that sucks. One more time. All right, take three. Return against Pikachu. Very, very good. Return against Blastoise. Rain Dance. Another return against Blastoise. We knock it out. Good again. Please know, like, 1 in 32 terrible range. Yes, we got a critical. It doesn't matter. Espeon knocked out. Let's use Return again. Pretty good. Over half. Amnesia again. All right. Full health to Charizard. Less than 7% chance of a critical hit. So we go for Return. Clearly, it's not going to want a KO. And that does some pretty good damage. But the battle's over. We've knocked out Charizard. The last thing is Venusaur. The only move it has is Solar Beam. And Fly should knock it out. So we're going to go for Fly. It loads up a Solar Beam. And there goes the... No! No! Okay. Okay. Man, these battles were annoying. But the truth is, as inconsistent as this seemed, I usually get a first try victory here. I got an unlucky critical hit and a really bad range from Espeon. Otherwise, yeah. And by the way, if Kenya does get knocked out at Venusaur, Gyarados with Dragon Rage can win. I've literally done that before. It's pretty funny. And that is Gold and Silver Minimum Battles. I hope you all enjoyed. But before we conclude the video, there's one last thing I need to do. This Firo was supposed to deliver mail. And darn it, it will. So while he might have been expecting a level 10 Spiro. After 116 battles, the mail will be delivered by a level 75 Spiro. Thanks for watching. Take care.